In bear markets, people want profits and cash flow and won't even pay up for that. In bull markets, they'll pay up for dreams. Short seller Jim Chanos is best known for calling the collapse of Enron, which at the time was the world's largest energy trading company. He was widely credited as the first person to figure out that Enron was a house of cards. Here's one thing that might come as a surprise. Enron wasn't the only stock he shorted during the episode. Enron was definitely part of a moment. And a lot of people don't think of Enron as one of the tech bubble or dot-com type stories, but it really was. It was a virtual energy company where it made its money not so much by the hard assets that it had, although it did have them, but by trading and by use of its know-how to leverage intellectual capital. As the dot-com era went on, people really began to embrace more and more stories that weren't quite tech companies, but had persuaded investors that they were disrupting existing businesses like energy. And so it was the perfect time for an aggressive company like that to be marketing that story to investors. Chanos was initially inspired by a Wall Street Journal column. The story did not single out Enron, but it exposed a problematic accounting practice that was just approved by regulators. He wrote that Enron and the other energy merchant banks, who were basically all in Houston, were celebrating because they had gotten the SEC to approve a relatively aggressive accounting treatment, mark to model accounting for their, their trading and derivatives business. You also talked to analysts covering Enron, and a lot of them gave strong buy ratings. Yeah. And when you talk to them, you realize it's kind of like a black box. They knew nothing. We literally invited every prominent sell side analyst who was bullish on Enron to come up and meet with us and have coffee or lunch and we sort of walked them through our story. They all basically said the same thing. They sort of shrugged and said, yeah, okay, I, we, we, we get it. We see the, 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 you can raise questions, but the company always makes good on its promises. It always yeah. beats its earnings estimate and always has. I mean, if they were going to fool you, that's exactly what they would do, right? right? The final thing that clicked with us and made us put a position on was just the fact of the matter that even if you believed their numbers, which increasingly we didn't, the company was earning about a 6% pre-tax return on its capital because their balance sheet was expanding so rapidly with trading positions. Why are investors paying huge multiples of book value for an energy hedge fund that earns 6% a year? We got short, I believe, our first shares in, in November of 2000. Okay. Then there was subsequent, you had the fortune story by Bethany McLean. Yeah. And then Jim Grant wrote it up in Grant's Interest Rate Observer. And then there were the street.com actually began to write about it. And so things began to kind of happen, particularly spring of 2001, kind of quickly. And then Skilling's resignation was August of 01. And that was the next super big red flag that mm -hmm. something was wrong. Not only was there heavy insider selling of the stock, but there were a lot of executive departures. And that combination is often lethal for a company particularly when expectations are high. And did you add to your position? We added pretty much, Every you know, event. almost all the way down because the news got worse and worse and worse and every piece of incremental bad news was much worse than what we even thought. Right. Leading up to its bankruptcy, the stock didn't go straight down. No. There was volatility around it. Did you hedge it? How did you We didn't back? hedge it. It was a pure short position. I don't think we ever bought puts in it. I think we pretty okay. much it was a straight short on the trade. Toward the very end of Enron's life, right before it filed for Chapter 11, mm -hmm. its competitor, Dynagy, was, I believe, across the street from Enron. Literally, they were sort of a Me Too Enron. As Enron shares sank fast in late 2001, Dynagy made a life-saving offer to acquire Enron in a $10 billion deal. The news boosted both Enron and Dynagy stocks. Chano said there was a conference call about a deal where Dynagy CEO made a jaw-dropping comment. You can't make this up. An analyst asked the Dynagy CEO if he was concerned about allegations of problems with Enron's accounting. And I'm going to paraphrase, but the CEO said something to the effect of, oh, that's fine. We've looked very carefully at Enron's accounting and it's the same as ours. And so we actually went out and shorted Dynagy on that comment the next morning. That went down 90%. It that's went crazy. from like 28 to three. The Enron bet and the Dynagy bet, were they big in your portfolio in terms of the size of the dollar? So amount? getting to risk management, we had had a rule for many, many years 
that no position could be above 5%. So okay. Enron at its peak was probably 4 or 5%. Okay. The Dynagy position was probably two or three. So it's one of the problems with the short side, right? You can be right. And, I know. And you make just what you put up. But combined, they were reasonably significant and helped us quite a bit in 2001. I also cover Warren Buffett. I remember mm -hmm. he said, short selling is very tempting because there are so many more overvalued stocks than undervalued stocks, but it's just really hard because of the risk. You have the two types of risk. You have the systematic market risk and the idiosyncratic risk. And Warren is right, and far more companies fail by the way, then succeed. The problem is markets go up over time. And the ones that really succeed are a disproportionate part of your return on the upside. Right. So the idea is to try to take the systematic risk out of what you're doing and isolate the idiosyncratic risk, but that's it's, easier said than done. Do you think the market environment now is tougher for short sellers? I think it's tougher in hindsight, but I think that the opportunities are still quite a bit there. I said 2021 was the most speculative market I've seen in my career. We're kind of getting back to some of that levels, not quite at 2021 levels, but the number of companies we think with broken business models yeah. would never be profitable that investors keep putting big valuations on is quite something in our view. You said in your letter to investors that it is still a golden age of fraud. Oh, I there think so, yeah. so many plenty of short opportunities. And when you look at recent cases of fraud like FTX, Theranos, do you see any similarities to Enron in any way? The one similarity is, is that and I teach a course on, on yeah. the history of financial fraud. The longer the cycle goes, whether the business cycle or the, the related financial cycle, i.e. bull market, the more people's sense of disbelief is eroded, right? They begin to believe things that are too good to be true. You know, FOMO, mm -hmm. use the current term. And so people begin to embrace narratives rather than fundamentals. The, the, yeah. the longer you go, well, I know they lose lots of money now, but they're going to make a lot of money in, in five future. years or whatever. And so that's as old as human nature. Yeah. And, and I don't think that's gonna change. The techniques change and the stories change, but in bear markets, people want profits and cash flow and won't even pay up for that. Mm -hmm. In bull markets, they'll pay up for dreams. Chanos recently converted his hedge fund into a family office and advisory business, citing waning interest in fundamental stock picking. A lot of our clients are institutions and high net worth individuals and they have their own trading capability anyway. At this point, being an advisor is just as much fun yeah. and a little less work. <laughs>